Square Ball Podcast. Phil Hay, playoff oh. playoff final. Yes. Bloody hell. Have it. <laughs> Have it. It's exciting, isn't it? So yes. Leeds, Leeds United yes. take on the take on Southampton in the playoff final. How are you feeling about it a, a couple of days out? You haven't yet spoken to Daniel Farker, but um, it, he doesn't generally give a lot away, does he, about how things are? He always sort of pleads calm. Um, are you calm as well? Are you calm as well, Michael? No. <laughs> uh, Michael was talking about anxiety dreams before we came on and um, recorded this, and I haven't had, had many of them. I'm, I'm really, really looking forward to um, this weekend. I, I kind of feel, looking back, like I felt quite a bit of trepidation before 06 and, and 08. Um, so it's not... It's not in any way confidence this time or, or overconfidence, but it, it's just... Like, Anticip- is it anticipation? Yeah, it definitely is yeah, anticipation. Yeah. I think it's the anticipation of what a good day it could be and actually feeling like, in terms of the quality of the team, Leeds have, have probably not had a better chance in a playoff final, um, certainly the of, of the last three. I can't really talk about, about 87. Um, but they're a better team than Blackwell's. They're a better team than McAllister's. Um, I think it's probably fair to say that they're playing a better team than Watford and Doncaster. Um, but I would say this is one of those 50-50 games where neither side is going to get away with playing well. I think it will it will totally come down to who plays best on the day, which isn't always the case because sometimes you just get this disparity between the teams, which means that one can, you know, can, can dip a little bit. You mean get away with um, playing badly rather than yeah, playing well? Or, yeah, or not, not, play, not, not playing, playing well. to the, yeah. the peak. Um, but I think, I think you will find on Sunday that the best team over over the course of the game, wins it. Yeah. Um, can do strange things to teams, can Wembley finals, can't they, in terms of just producing an under-par performance. So I'm I'm trying to remain again on the on the side of positive when it when it comes to this. And I took great comfort out of how Leeds embraced the crowd in the semi-final. The way that the players were trying to simultaneously wind up the crowd, but also then on the pitch, rather than just getting swept along by the occasion, there were moments where we're going to look after the ball here for five or 10 minutes, just calm it down. Farker was on the on the sideline saying, calm it down. You could see it translating into the players who said, what we'll do is we'll just take a little bit of time now. We'll do that thing where we knock it around the back, retain possession and just get our heads in order. Um, I was encouraged by that and I, I hope they can carry that forward into Wembley. I sort of hope as well that it's one of those games that gives you more to remember than, than previous finals. Michael and I were chatting about this and saying that, I have very few clear memories of 06 or 08. In fact, to, in, in 06, the game against Watford and Cardiff, the only two things that really stand out, um, because things like, you know, the players jumping out of their skins when the, the fireworks went off, didn't really see that until afterwards, until you, you watched back a bit of the footage and picked up on it. But Watford's first goal, and I had a quick watch of it before it came on just to refresh my memory, was Ashley Young corner, which um, Demerit headed in. And I remember clear as day as the ball dropped and Leeds defence kind of split apart. Demerit ran from about 10 yards back to, to head it. As he ran towards it, two Leeds fans who were sat behind me, one of them just said, oh, fuck. And and you could see that. You know, you just realised that he was going to, he was, you know, he was going to meet that about four yards out and he was going to score. And then the other thing was the free kick given away by Derry, which was the point at which you thought any chance of a fight back here, nah, it's just completely gone. And then Doncaster, I remember Hater obviously scoring the goal. And the only thing beyond that, really, it was a chance that sat out for Douglas with, you know, either a couple of minutes of injury time or normal time to go, which he just kind of swung into the crowd and, and that was that. And they were totally, totally forgettable days. Um, and I have a feeling that this will be a much, much better game, this one, because they are two really good sides. All I can remember from the 06 one in Cardiff was obviously there was the long train journey down, the long train journey back. But of the game itself was, yeah, it was hope very quickly evaporating. But in terms of evaporating, it was the humidity inside the stadium. Mm-hmm. The, the roof was closed. I just remember how uncomfortable I felt in that stadium. Yeah. That's, that's all I, I can remember and from the rained, game. And it rained. It rained all yeah. day and it was torrential. Yeah. Um, I, and Doncaster, again, it, it was an early start. I just remember being tired all day. I can remember exactly where I was sat. It was down by the corner flag on the bottom tier at Wembley. I think I can remember Doncaster's goal going in just after half time, and that's it. That's all I've retained from both. I remember. Both days. I remember them going through on goal a couple of times, and Ankergren pulling off a couple of saves against Doncaster. But I mean, we were well beaten in that. I know yeah. it was one nil, but one nil probably flattered us from my memory of it. And I was saying across, and I lump Villa in here as well. Across the three finals I've been to, I can barely remember us having a single shot on target, yeah. which is remarkable, really, from three games. We've never scored. 
I know. Have I? But we've not, even, we've not even come close. There's not <laughs> even been one where you thought someone should have scored. There've been odd shots from distance that you kind of go into a keeper's hands and you go, all yeah. right. And that's it. Well, that's exactly what I was talking about. About um, final uh, occasions, occasionally doing strange things to, to footballers, and then they kind of go into their shell and well, just, they don't you, ever respond. I'll to give it. you a really good example of that. You were talking about feeling quite tired on the Donc- uh, for the Doncaster game. David Pronton played in that game, and I remember him saying afterwards, when you walked out into Wembley for the first time, went onto the pitch after getting there on the on the coach, he said it was the stadium was so massive that it almost he felt like it almost sucked the energy from him. You know, it, he felt a little bit um, overawed by the fact that it was just this huge, huge arena that felt totally, totally cavernous. And I think none of these players, Leeds players, not many Southampton's players either, will be particularly used to that. Um, and used to a crowd of of that size. But I do think football's changed, though, quite a lot. And I think players have got better and better as time's gone on at just being able to apply themselves to their training and the the tactics and the the plan for the day. These two teams are both very strong, very good, um, very, very capable. I don't think think there's any reason why it can't be a really good final on Sunday. You know, for, for anybody neutral watching, why it won't be a good game. I'm, I'm terrible, aware, terrible nil nil now. Yeah, it? yeah, almost certainly. I'm aware it applies to some Southampton players as well, but some of the people we've got in the team this year as well do give me a little bit more confidence. Like Rodon has played in some very big games for Wales. You feel like some of and Nonto have probably got a fair, they've got sort of a youthful swagger about them, which means they yeah. will probably they'll embrace it. Yeah. Exactly, they'll probably want to. They'll probably think this is a good chance for me to show what I'm about and play well, as opposed to this is the stage yeah. I should be on. Yeah, whereas some people might think, oh shit. This is I'm probably not really good enough to be here, which is you know the impression you've had yeah, yeah. on occasions before. So there are, there are enough people in the team like Gan Kamara's played in old firm games, which will have been a big big atmosphere, big crowd. So are we going to win? I don't know. We'll see. Well, we'll see. What we, I, I think it's too it's too tight to call. You couldn't put a I, cigarette I, paper between I, the two I teams. I agree but, with that yeah. though. I, th- I think when you start to look through the Leeds squad, there are a lot of players who just the the presence of them gives you confidence about Leeds playing well. I suspect that a lot of Southampton sports would probably say the same about them as well. There's no way you can pretend that they don't have a good team. And and actually, as the as the playoff against West Brom went on, particularly the second leg, that, that turned into a really good performance from them. And I don't think that was necessarily an easier semi-final than, than Norwich over two legs. So again, the whole thing just looks evenly matched. And I do wonder whether... For Leeds, the, the absolute key to this is going to be the quality of the, the pressing against yeah. Southampton because you know what Southampton are going to do. They're going to hold it deep in the way that they do. They're going to pass it around. They're going to tempt Leeds to to pounce, to try and press, to try and nick the ball, and they'll try and play through them. And that will be their strategy because it's always their strategy yeah. uh, under Russell Martin. So if Leeds get that right and it works, then automatically they, they have an advantage. If they get it wrong and it doesn't work, then it becomes a, a very difficult game quite quickly, I think. If you look at how Leicester undid Southampton in their games this season, it was through effective pressing. Yeah. It was pressing them in those moments at the back and then forcing them into into mistakes. Just returning to that that theme of of players responding to the occasion. Now, you know the media day that you've just done up at, mm-hmm. at Thor- Thorpe Arch when you spoke to Melier. I think it was the BBC lads, BBC Radio Leeds um, spoke to Joel Piru and he was saying, "I want it to come tomorrow." Mm-hmm. Like a day or two, he was saying, "I want I want to play it tomorrow." And I, I not like, slept. Yeah, like it looks like he hasn't, does it? <laughs> Absolutely baked. But um, he, um, yeah, him saying that again fills me with a little bit of encouragement. It gives me confidence thinking that they're they're ready to step up to this because that they're eager to get out there and play this game. Like I say, I, I contrast it with some of the other playoff finals when it's always felt like we've had a an absolute ton of bricks. We're carrying them around in a bag, like you know, we need to get out of League One, or it's been sixteen years, or whatever, or fifteen, or whatever it was at that point under the you know the first Bielsa season. Just this this sort of existential terror that we carried forward into these. And actually, it doesn't feel... I don't know we'll have to sell players if we don't go up to balance the books and stuff, but it doesn't feel like it's it's complete and utter death or glory. It feels like there's an opportunity for glory. It'll be shit if we lose, and I'll hate it, and I'll park it away with all the other memories of crap games that I've been to where I wish Leeds had done better. But it doesn't feel like the end of the world if, if we don't I, I will say, though, about those old games, you reflect on them with the lens of having lost them and the actual process of getting to the yeah, final. Yeah, yeah. Because my my nagging doubt of this is we were in bad form. We basically played really well in one game to get us to the final. But that's that's really one very good performance in the last six weeks or yep. something. And going into the both the championship Watford final and the Donny final, we'd not been in great form in either of them, but we got through semis and then got to the final and kind of reverted to the way we'd been playing 
three yeah, weeks yeah. before. So, so I have I have some fears around that. To, I suppose not to conclude that we've we are fixed because we beat Norwich four 0 But do, do, do you, I wonder if you're going to say what I'm going to say, Phil? I'll ask you. Um, but did you not see like the last twenty minutes at Norwich was like almost like. Hang on a second. We've kind of we've we've sort of crisis managed our way through this bad form, and we've we've got a foothold in this tie now, and we controlled it for the last twenty minutes, and they didn't threaten us, and then we built on that at Ellen Road and absolutely swept Norwich away. And what, what was and, and it feels like we're building momentum. Yeah, what I was going to say is, don't you think that Farker actually? Yeah, it was one kind of outstanding performance, but actually managed the two ties really well. If I if I you know right across them, and and okay, Norwich had more of the first half at Carroll Road, but not in a way that really really hurt Leeds. If I think back to that Carlisle tie, Leeds were incredibly lucky to still be in that after the first leg. That's how kind of average they were in that game. That's how much better Carlisle were. And then if you move on to, you know, Grayson and Millwall, Leeds did not play well um, at the Den. They they played well in parts at Ellen Road and they had the Becchio goal. But I still think over the two legs, Millwall probably deserved to shade that just about, um, particularly the pre- because of the pressure that was on them after um, Becchio's, Becchio's goal. And then Bielsa with the Derby game, first one, you know, perfect, really, absolutely exactly what he was looking for um, down at Derby. And then the second leg, a, a complete disaster. Whereas what you've seen with Farker this time is that it's looked like it's been logical and coherent and that it has worked right from the start. What, the way he wanted it to go at Carroll Road, followed by the way he wanted it to go at Ellen Road, seems to have fallen into place really well. Um, I think it probably helps that there are not that many players in this squad who are kind of affected by what's gone on before or have necessarily been involved in, in what's gone on before, certainly in the in the championship. And what you said about Piro is is true. There is a, a fair amount of confidence in it and it'll have been helped by the, the semi-final. I mean, I also interviewed Archie Gray on Monday and that piece is online today. And like his confidence is just almost funny. Like <laughs> I, I, I sort of said to him, so, you know, when, when Bielsa was saying to you, train with the first team and, um, sit on the bench and you were 15 did you actually feel ready for it and he just said oh yeah definitely and I was like oh, all right okay you know, like, and and he's it's he's a he's a lovely guy he's a really pleasant character he's he's dead grown up and mature for for 18 but he's 100% got that elite edge you know if not arrogance but just this total total confidence of um bulletproof with this this bulletproof, is good. Yeah. yeah and he's going to be you know he's going to be so, so good. And you can tell that from the way he plays, but you can also tell it from the way he talks and, and the way he kind of, you know, the way he, he he sort of sounds about his own self-assurance, which is really, really impressive. Um, So there you've got an 18-year-old, you know, really young guy in the team who, if you're putting money on, you'd, you'd totally back to just have a good game on Sunday. This is a club where you need... You need broad shoulders, don't you? I think in order yeah. to, oh, oh, to succeed, yeah, and absolutely, and maybe whether it's the the, the grey family genes and you know the, the legacy that's behind him, or whether it's coming through the academy or some combination of both, that is one of the things I think it's why Leeds play uh, Leeds fans, sorry, like to latch on to players who've come through the academy because having that grounding from a very young age and being exposed to the club and the fan base and understand understanding what it's like, it's possibly a little bit easier to to get your head around because it's always it's all you've ever known, isn't it? Whereas players who sometimes come in will go, bloody hell, look, yeah. at, look at this. Uh, th- there's another aspect to that though as well, which is that the, the, the academy manages um, the, the kids who've been in it from a really young age so well. I mean, not only um, in a footballing sense, but in terms of the personality and attitude and just general levels of, of maturity, there are a lot of very, very impressive young men in the academy. And I, and. And beyond that, it's also an academy that does produce really high, good standard of football. I think the problem for academy graduates when the standard of an, uh, standard of an academy isn't particularly good is that you are homegrown players. People either expect a lot from you or want a lot from you, but you're not necessarily good enough to be able to deliver that. Whereas when you've got people like Gray coming through in the same way as you know Delph and, and House and, and others, they're that good. Um, and I think this... No offence to housing, because I was a big housing fan, but I think this applies more to Delph and, and to Gray. When you're that good, you're going to be able to to cope with it. And it might be the bloodline and it might be the, the genetics, but I also think... I mean, I asked, I was asking Archie about his brother, Harry, who is kind of coming up behind him and might be about to go... He's younger, obviously, and, and might be about to go through the same sort of learning curve. And I was saying to him, you know, how, how much are you having to sort of help him? How much do you pass this on to him? He just said... I don't really, because I don't think I need to. I just sort of say to him, like, just when I was young, people just 
said, that's trusting your ability and you'll, you'll be fine. So the only thing I would say to him is, work hard, do the extras, you know, put it in every day. But in terms of actually being a top footballer, um, he probably just will be. I think the yeah. thing is, I think, I think we come at this from the position of talentless men. <laughs> and, and having that sort of confidence. Tal- about, yeah. Talentless men in the yeah. 40s. Yeah. About anything. Yeah. But about anything. Yeah. I just find bewildering to be like, uh, it is. yeah, it's going to be absolutely fine. Be like, yeah. I don't feel that confident about it. Like the yeah. drive here, I feel like oh, I could all go wrong this. <laughs> I think what I like about Gray as well is that, um, and he is young, so maybe as time goes on, it'll be different. But when, when you interview him, you don't get like vast amounts out of him. You know, he doesn't um, expose himself uh, in terms of what he says. And, he, you know, he's very polished and, and very good. But it just it's just like his football speaks, really, you know, and, and that's it. And... You know, from a, from a journalistic point of view, you love people who talk, but if you're a footballer, it's better to speak with your feet. It yeah. might be his last game for us as well, of course. <laughs> oh, oh, Michael. <laughs> Come on. Christ. What an absolute doom and gloom. <laughs> Just <laughs> bloody pie end this pooper. Now. Yeah. What, I was, what I was going to say, a, a nice little symbol of, of Gray's maturity and his, and his role within the dressing room was when he found himself in the centre of that huddle post match as well. And I think a couple of the senior players were like, Do you want to get out? <laughs> the grown ups are going to talk now, but he probably considers himself to be something of a grown up. Yeah, he, he, well, he, he's already um, captaining it. Um, international level youth team isn't he um so he he has captaincy potential for Leeds or whatever you know further down the line he, he is gonna is gonna be one of those <coughs> when he's still um, here when he's still here yeah uh, but I, again it's you know i i just think he is an example of the way that the academy at leeds has been working for such a long long time now they are so good at taking talent like that and making the most of it and sometimes they get smoked you know if City bid for somebody like Finlay Gorman what can you do Gorman Gorman goes um, I don't know you know no idea about Gorman's family but the one thing I know about Grays is that they're incredibly savvy level headed bunch who want the best for him very much want the best for Leeds um, I think will be really good at, at keeping his head straight um, just good fun nice people um, and that that's really reflected in him as well. I think because of the season we've had and we've always been in the promotion mix, it's been nice to be able to properly enjoy Gray as well this year because when we've been terrible and good players have come through, or league, I mean, we're decent in League One, but it was League One. So when you saw Delph and when you saw Lewis Cook, you went, oh, God, they'll be gone. So they'll be, they'll, they, <laughs> are, they, are, they are quite <laughs> rightly not going to hang around here for very long because why would they? They're, they're clearly a, a serious cut above all of this. Whereas with Gray, you think, well... If we can go up, then yeah, there's no reason he would leave, and we can get to see him for another listen, year. Listen and... to you rowing back to shore now. No, but it, it's a good, <laughs> it's a good thing, you know, for you, your most talented players to actually challenge a club to aspire to things and to achieve things. I always remember when Snowgrass went from Leeds to Norwich, and everybody was frustrated about that, and there was all this thing about oh, pass him on the way down and and blah de blah. And I was, I was speaking to Eddie Gray about it, and Eddie said, "Well." Why would he? Why would he want to stay here though? He's a really good player, like you know, Premier League standard player. Leeds don't. This was in the the Warnock era. Leeds don't look like they're anywhere near the Premier League. Why is he going to sacrifice everything that he's got to specifically play for Leeds? And I think the family would be desperate to see Gray stay here for ever and a day and to do everything that he can um, at Leeds. But at the same time, I think they would be realistic enough to to know that if the club were going nowhere, and I don't think defeating the playoff final means that they would be going nowhere. I think there's a very good chance of being um, strong again next year. But if it did get to a point where Leeds were meandering again, like Michael said about Delph and Kirk and, and others, you can't really keep somebody that talented. Well, that's that the, real, that the reality of long-term... Um occupancy of the championship isn't it really but let's it's let's the reality not, of human nature let's yeah. not but think he, about he's just that. he's just a terrific terrific prospect um just returning back to the actual the final itself then what are you looking for i mean you know park the game for a minute but what are you what are you looking forward to most overall about this this whole thing this whole occasion being in london not hung over and <laughs> um not well you might be hung over on you train. mean happy <laughs> well, no, I mean, I mean, on the actual morning of the game, because right. I've been the previous once, once bitten. Yeah, the previous playoff finals, I've been disgracefully hungover <laughs> or just <laughs> nervous and on a train and like just busy, isn't it? Whereas I'm in London the night before, I can, I've got theoretically a nice, easy. I mean, I could technically walk to Wembley on the morning. It'd take a while, yeah. but you know, if I, I will be there in reasonable time and hopefully just be able to absorb the atmosphere more than I have in previous games. I suppose I'm looking forward to that. It's the Atmos, isn't it? Um, the scramble for tickets has been mad. I've had so many messages from people saying, can you get me tickets? To which I say, no, 
<laughs> absolutely no access to any yeah, at somebody all. did tweet yeah tweet the square boys today how can i get a ticket for the final i, um, I don't you know can, you can yeah, yeah. Well, well if you got about if you got about five six hundred quid you can yeah, yeah. seems to be yeah. the gist of it but yeah hell of a lot of money but the atmosphere would be great and if you remember the against watford you had a packed leeds end you had a watford end which had the good good numbers in it but wasn't particularly full and the same against doncaster as well whereas southampton has sold out as well they've got um They've got a good fan base. They've got plenty, plenty of numbers coming. It'll be a really, really good, really good occasion. I, I'm looking forward to seeing, hearing half of Wembley singing. That's that's the one thing that I really, really enjoyed about that Doncaster game and my Wembley experience. Then, because I've talked myself into just as a coping mechanism, I hate Wembley. I hate everything it stands. It's too big. Seats are too red. All this and but actually, you know, if we go there and win on Sunday, it'll reframe my whole thinking about the place. Mm-hmm. But the one thing I did take out of it was. How I I remember tearing up when the Leeds fans when we all sang um, just before kick off and it might be marching on together I can't quite remember probably was uh, and just thinking wow this 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 is the shit <laughs> this doesn't come around very often and I'm looking forward to that again because it doesn't come around very often for for Leeds we're not a club that gets there all the time we're not like Man City's fans who who are kind of a little bit indifferent to it you know because they get semi finals there all the time they're in most of the domestic cup finals these days bored of it. Uh, uh, what be quite interesting with Farker at his press conference will be to get the impression of what it is that's most on his mind you know whether it's coping with the atmosphere itself whether it's actually the you know pure tactical battle with Martin and Southampton given the way they're they're going to play I asked him after the the Norwich win how much are you going to have to adapt depending on who you're playing or do you just go down there and do your thing and he said well we we want to go there and do our thing, but we are going to have to give a lot of thought to you know who it is that we're up against. If it's West Brom, that is a totally different prospect to Southampton because of the way they play. So it's going to be a pretty big, pretty big tactical test. But I think do you, do you reckon Martin will go three at the back like he did at Ellen Road because he said he hinted in, in that didn't he that he was experimenting with some ideas for the playoffs? Yeah, I don't know. They're going to have Chad Adams back as well by the sounds of it. Yeah, I, I I'm honestly not sure. I don't know. I, I don't know whether it would be the moment to kind of risk on something, take a risk on something that you haven't kind of stuck to generally, but we'll we'll find out find out soon enough. I, I, I guess on I, such, just, I guess on such things, finals turn as well. They, they do, they do. Um, I I think having seen quite a bit of criticism latterly of Farker tactically, I think some of it was justified. Um, I think tactically he handled the Norwich semi final really well, yeah. really well. Certainly better than Wagner did in the end. Yeah. Kilgallen yeah. that left back. <laughs> I knew that was a Healy, bad day when I saw that. Healy on the bench. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I'm looking forward to as well. Hopefully we'll get to do a, a match ball live streaming from the top of Wembley Way from our Airbnb and hopefully it will be celebratory in mood rather than uh, another grief cast like it was after after Derby. But um, you it'll, know, have da- to, it'll have to be going some to beat Derby in no, terms of the, yeah. just the shock factor of yeah. what, on, yeah, earth, what on earth have I just yeah. seen. Because I, I feel like this could... You know, I'm, I fully accept this could go either way. The odds reflect it as well, don't they? It's, it's a fairly down the middle sort of a tie. Someone starts well, they'll probably win it, whatever. Whereas the Derby game, at Stuart Dallas scores and everyone goes, well, hey, book yeah. the trains. Yeah. I, I, bet some, yeah. I bet some people did, actually. Yeah, whoever gets the first goal, I think, is, is pretty good. It's an, obvi- like it's an that, obvious yeah. thing to say, isn't it? But- no, but I think, um, I think if you look in the Premier League at the moment, it seems to matter less and less scoring first. You had so many um, teams who recover from positions where they're getting beaten um to to win games but this feels like one of those where the the initiative from the big uh, from the first goal will be really really big i don't think either there's an awful lot you can do do about the fact that you're coming up against another really good team and that just makes it a kind of straight shootout doesn't it which somebody's got to lose um and i think whoever does lose it will need to be fairly philosophical and saying well you know play that 10 times out of 10 you probably win five they probably win five and and that's how it is i think leeds have been the better team over the course of the season, but there hasn't been a huge amount in it. No, no. I think um, if you st- if you just stuck both teams in this year's Premier League, they'd probably both survived. So, yeah, well, yeah, so, no, certainly I think, if I think you're allowed, right. if you're yeah. allowed to leave that bottom three in. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Um, I mean, we haven't spoken about the fact, have we, that Southampton have beaten Leeds twice this season and nah, I don't count deservedly. For. But, uh, but this is <laughs> this is the thing. I I, I think, absolute... actually, do you know what? I, th- I wonder if that might actually help us a little bit. In terms well, I'm of absolutely managing. certain that Martin will not um, yeah. shout the odds about that. I mean, um, man, in terms of managing expectation from our point of view as well, that we don't go into it overly confident yeah. and, and we know that there's a, there is a problem there to solve, isn't there? I think there's no danger of overconfidence um, among the players or among the supporters. And that probably applies to Southampton as well. 
you're down and back in a day, Phil, aren't yes, you? Yes, going down Sunday. No, yes, no socialising. See you guys all on the train. Whereas, uh, yeah, we'll be hanging around, won't we? So mm. um, if you are heading down, we will see you there. If not, join us on the uh, the Matchball live stream afterwards for, oh, God, let's, please. You've got the graphics ready, haven't you? You showed I've, me those earlier. There's no trophies on it or anything like that, but we've prepared the live stream graphics. It's all going to be running off a laptop. Hopefully it all works. And I don't know, what else can I say? But Godspeed, gentlemen. Thank you. See you on the other side. The Square Ball Podcast.